All right, hello everybody. Welcome back to our instructional design to Dungeons and Dragons event. Thank you everybody for being here. Let's see, yeah, I'm seeing some emojis pop up on there. And if you can in the chat area, please give us a shout out. Tell us where you're coming in from, just so that I know that that's working. Um, we had a fantastic first session today and with Don Metcalf. I was so glad to see everybody there. And, um, and again, I apologize. I barely have a voice because, uh, yeah, the last the last few days have just been really busy for me. I think I picked up something from a, from a conference. And so, uh, but I'm here. All right. Yeah. Looking and seeing chat populate very nicely. Thanks, everyone. All right. So our, our next session. Um, very excited to have these two speakers, Keegan Longwheeler, who was actually at our gamification event that we did a few months ago, um, spoke at that one and definitely knew he was somebody that I would love to have returned to TLDC. And here he is. He also hosted on Friday um, uh, our, our first intro to d and uh, session. That was so fun. I can't even I can't even tell you just how excited I was. I just had that feeling of that D and D feeling that I had when I was a kid, when you were doing it, which, um, you know, I just hadn't really felt that in a real, in a really, really long time. So it was great, um, having you host that. And then John Stewart, you were, um, you just did our, was that our AI event that you, yeah. AI and higher education. You opened up our last conference last month with, um, Wendy, um, Iaco Bello. So, um, thank you for coming back. And the both of you, is it university of Oklahoma is, or is it how? Yeah. Okay. Great glad I remembered. And so with that, I'm not going to talk too much because obviously my voice is just terrible right now, but I'll let the both of you take over. And um, if you need anything, I'll be behind the scenes waiting to help. All right. Sounds great. Um, let me uh, go ahead and do some screen share um, as well. Um, let's see. Ooh, I'm on a new computer, so one sec. See if it does it. Window. All right, share. Um, all right, is that sharing currently, or is that not sharing? Not yet. Oh, okay, okay. One second. <laughs> for... Well, Keegan's uh, figuring this out. Uh, just as a little bit of background, yeah, we're at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, we're in our Office of Digital Learning here at OU. Um, we used to be part of a Center for Teaching Excellence, and that was where these projects started out from. And so what we're going to be showing you today was some of the projects we've been working on for the last nearly a decade now um, from the Center for Teaching Excellence. And so it started off as professional development for uh, faculty, but also we wanted to uh, include graduate students who, you know, were likely to become faculty, and even undergraduates if they wanted to join us um, in our in our professional development. And so Keegan had been working already uh, with our Center for Teaching Excellence for a few years, uh, starting more than a decade ago. And he'd been doing sort of professional developments that were like how to use iPads in the classroom, how to uh, do all sorts of tech integrations, even old school stuff like, you know, projectors and um, how to, how to you know, just use the tech in a classroom. But we were wanting to start playing a little bit more with how to do game-based learning, how to integrate games into the classroom. And so Keegan sort of came to me with this idea in like 2014, 2015, and said, I've got an idea as to how to really integrate um, sort of a Dungeons and Dragons feel into our, our professional development classes and how to uh, introduce faculty and graduate students to that. And so what you're going to see is sort of a project that we really started working on. Keegan started working on it in 2013, 2014, and we were able to launch it in 2015, and we've been working on it sort of ever since. And so sort of give you that journey and lessons learned along the way. All right. Well, sorry for that, um, having to quit and relaunch AirMeet to get screen sharing, but I believe it's up now, correct? All right. Um, all right, so I want to dive in um, because as John kind of mentioned, I want to take us back in time. I'm going to take us back in time to 2015, where we kind of embarked on a uh, faculty learning community at the time uh, that asked the question of what games have to teach us about learning. And that was Goblin, is what it was affectionately called at the, at the time. 
And Goblin was a, 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 I mean, it was a faculty learning community, but it was also, it was much more than that. It became a model that we have used uh, for several other kinds of sessions and things now. Um, it also was a game that was developed to kind of get folks into uh, play as quickly as possible. And that game that was developed had character cards and character art that we had put together. Um, they were taken from uh, OER, um, Open Educational Resources, uh, to kind of build and craft and do this. But it was essentially kind of a like a homebrew game that its main goal was to uh, be easy as possible to get in and start playing. Like that was its main goal. Um, and so that game was constructed, but I wanna kind of like, before we dive into like what Goblin is overall, I wanna talk about a little bit of the history of the model itself, because Goblin is based off of, so I have to go back to my roots in science education and learning cycle theories and those kinds of things. It has a lot of foundation in those kinds of ideas and pedagogies and such. And so uh, consequently, Goblin itself starts out with an experience and that experience is narrative gameplay in a tabletop role-playing game style. And what we did at the time was we made the gameplay itself uh, as the kind of seed for discussion is what we did. So the gameplay itself informed what we would delve into in discussion. So if we were covering things like scaffolding or team learning, the, the challenge, the experience itself would be uh, would lead then into the discussion. It would lay the groundwork. It would kind of give some of that experience and then folks could connect what they just experienced to their classroom experience and to their design experience and all of those kinds of aspects of it. Um, so that's the kind of first step in this process. But the other aspect of this is in between sessions, that discussion led to independent study. And that independent study, uh, fed back into the narrative itself. How how might it feed back into the narrative? Well, the players actually were able to, this was a gamified process where players gained experience points for uh, participating, showing up, but also doing more research from week to week. And so that is the model itself. And the more folks kind of did independent research and did independent study, the higher their characters kind of leveled up and became over the course of the experience itself. So what does this look like in practice? In practice, our sessions were 90 minutes uh, and they were composed of 30 minutes of that kind of experiential gameplay and about 60 minutes of discussion. Sometimes our gameplay went a little over, sometimes it was a little bit shorter. Um, but the big kind of highlight I want to bring up is that additional scholarship in between uh, was kind of a huge piece of it for us. And that has been something that we have carried on to other versions that we have uh, generated over, over the years as well. Um, so yeah, that is kind of like an overview of the Goblin kind of structure, the framework that which we used. And uh, these are the topics that we kind of went into. These were selected by us as the designers the first time around. So we did, we covered scaffolding and team learning and uh, overcoming failure and game-based learning and gamification. And it was kind of all linked into one narrative that was uh, very tightly constructed as, you know, a continuous experience. Um, but yeah, that's our 1.0 version. And I want to take a second and pause for a moment because I want to... Uh, uh, shift over to John as we are thinking about our lessons learned. Yeah, so the from the first experience, we weren't quite sure, you know, what to expect, um, but we ended up running several different sessions. We had enough people sign up for Goblin that we ended up running multiple sort of parallel sessions of Goblin. And, and um, what we found was that we had faculty and graduate students participating from across the university. So we had people from the history department, we had people from philosophy, uh, one of the most eager participants was from biology. We had engineers, uh, we had deans, we had, you know, uh, graduate students. Um, we had a couple of undergraduates who participated in a few sessions. And so we got people together from all across the university. And these are people who hadn't really, for the most part, hadn't met before. 
And so this was a great way for them to get to know each other. And the experience of the gaming um, broke the ice from the first session. And by the end of, I think we did six sessions in that first Goblin playthrough and people had gotten to know each other. They'd gotten to learn their, their game styles, but also the courses they were teaching. And so the games gave them something to talk about. And they were, the way that we built the first game, there were skills that you could use. Like one person was able to like freeze a bad guy, like freeze them in place as a block of ice. And someone else came up and hit the bad guy with a sledgehammer and shattered them. And it was just such a memorable like combination of skills that we hadn't even anticipated them doing. But it was these two people from wildly different departments sort of working together on this this thing that I still remember, you know, eight years later in terms of how they defeated this big bad guy much faster than we anticipated, sort of broke the game for the day, um, but with a really fun outcome. And what the the folks got out of that was, you know, in that first week we were we were introducing them in, into the game and we we're talking about sort of what games do successfully that scaffold the gaming experience. And then we use that to transfer over to you know, what does your syllabus look like? How do you introduce students into your class? How do you scaffold the learning experience for them? And so we sort of ease people into it. And rather than focusing on, you know, leaderboards and stickers that you can give out and badges and all of that, which is I think what people were expecting in our, our gameplay professional development, we were able to give them, you know, this experience that they were able to build off of and think about their classes more deeply. And so it was a really uh, joyful experience. It was something that broke the ice and that we learned could be a really good sort of team building experience that we would use later on. Um, but just the takeaways for me are that it's something that I can, I don't remember most of the things I did last week. This is something we did eight years ago and I remember it vividly. And so um, those experiences as a, as a group leader, as a, as a project leader on this professional development were really meaningful, but also the, the people that were in that session, I still talk to and we still talk about those sessions. And so it was, it was really useful for me in those ways. Yeah, speaking of talking to folks, uh, one of the players <laughs> I'm actually playing D&D &D now with, um, after after many years, another player, him and I have been connected. I've wrote letters of recommendation for him because he uh, like revamped his course around games and learning uh, and such as well. So it's it's been kind of, it was wild at the time because we literally had folks tell us that this is what they looked forward to each week. You know, of all the things that they were doing, this is what they looked forward to each week. And I want to say that I think that shows very well in terms of some of the data that we collected. For example, now this slide is, uh, um, uh, so goblins are greater than iPads. The reason this slide exists is because uh, Goblin itself had the highest level of attendance of any of our professional developments we had ever done, more so than one where the uh, the attendees were given iPads if they came and attended. So uh, I think that kind of speaks for itself, right, in terms of the narrative and the experience being more desirable to the attendees than even, you know, a, a fancy device to go with it. Uh, but some of the kind of statistics that we have from the first run in 2016 include that, you know, 22 participants over several sessions, they wrote... 35,000 words among them between blog posts and reflection entries and various things, those accumulated into almost 200 kind of artifacts that were that were created between those blog posts and those resources shared and everything. Um, so it was a highly kind of engaging aspect of it. Um, but at the time, there were a few things that we weren't uh, completely satisfied with as well. These are, you know, this is one of the character cards and such. And um, one of the hardest things in development was actually while using the OER uh, imagery um, that we were kind of seeking and kind of the ethos and vibe that we were after, it was actually really difficult to find certain things that we wanted. Um, for instance, representation of different, um, whoa, I'm sorry, that uh, went all the way to the end there. <laughs> um, let me do this and jump back. Um, uh, so the character cards that we had had uh, at the time, 
uh, you know, it was hard to find things like um, diverse representations of people, diverse representations of gender and things. You know, we could find representations, but they weren't always things that we wanted to, you know, be shared and part of our uh, kind of our open play as well. So those were kind of things that we were running into the first time that we did this way back in the day. Um, so I want to accelerate a little bit into the future to 2021 because Goblin has evolved over the years and the lessons that we've learned and implemented uh, have changed over time. And I wanna, this is a kind of a interesting time point because many years of development had occurred and then this is when we ran a 2.0 version. So what did that Goblin kind of evolution look like? Well, after a lot of thought, one thing that we kind of moved away from was that in-house game that we built. Um, we moved towards a universal system for a number of reasons, but one of them I think that was kind of exciting was uh, it was a more, we were building more transferable tabletop role-playing game skills uh, because we were introducing folks to games that already existed that they could then go and play themselves. They didn't have to come to us as the only folks on the planet with this single kind of design of a game. And it was fine at the time, but, you know, over time of learning, there's, there's something to be said about already existing communities and open kind of practitioners in the game space and the game design space and all of the help and resources that you can lean on in those communities. So we moved away from a proprietary kind of game and into a more universal game. Uh, we continued to use the same kind of pedagogically inspired, learning cycle inspired uh, models that we had uh, been kind of pioneering for ourselves in our own kind of professional development space at the time. Um, we moved to open-ended storytelling. So rather than us determining what topics would be there, we moved to the actual players themselves would determine this, and then we would move on from, from there. We also kind of uh, moved, so that is the, yeah, that is the player driven topics as well. Um, we also moved to, custom character sheets and creation. So rather than us generating some pre-generated ones, we actually move to folks can build their own characters and they can tune them and then they can select their own art that they feel represents them and their the identity of the character that they want to play and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and then the other aspect that we were kind of focused on as we were as this all was evolving is we'd been approached by lots of folks over the years that wanted to run it, but it was too heavy of a lift for other folks to kind of pick it up and run with it. Um, it just it required too much context. Like I said, you know, we weren't leaning on communities of already established games, so there was nowhere else for these individuals that wanted to run this experience to turn other than us. And you know, we were a bottleneck in that process. So what does that mean in practice? The universal system that we selected is we selected the Powered by the Apocalypse system, which is a open game mechanic system uh, that was uh, built for the game Apocalypse World, which is why it's now called Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, that's kind of the historical aspect of that. And we chose it because it is not only simpler than um, it's, it's less crunchy is the term than something like a Dungeons and Dragons. It also is more free flowing and conversational. There's no like turn order during uh, in, uh, encounters or anything like that. So it was, it was very good for the flow of kind of conversation. The game that we chose uh, was Offworlders, and that was for a number of reasons. We kind of changed to going into space rather than fantasy for our genre so that we could more easily engage for conversations around technology. Offworlders at the time was also uh, free to download, so all of our players could get a copy of it and they could have the manual with them as well. Um, so. That was the selection of game. Um, Galactic 
Goblin was what it was called for 2.0 as well. Uh, again, we use the same the same model for this process. So the same like entry of gameplay that leads into discussion that then leads into independent study where players are rewarded for participating at every level, at every stage. The topics that they chose were phenomenal as well. Um, we started with the, the only one that we selected was unexpected challenges. And that was because uh, it's hard to get folks to brainstorm topics and then be ready to talk about them immediately. So we did all of our brainstorming for all of these topics at the, our first session. Uh, and, you know, Things like imposter syndrome were phenomenal kind of discussions that I don't know that we would have necessarily had at the at the time because uh, you know some folks enjoy talking about things like humor human centered assessment more than others because of their own context that they're bringing. Some folks are more into kind of uh, what scalable experiences look like, especially if they're teaching in large large enrollment classes or whatever the case is. So it was awesome to adjust this to be uh, experienced by the people and and in a sense led by the people um, as well our players that were participating um, our character sheets looked a lot different uh, they were kind of more open-ended they allowed for choices and and such um, as well and we moved to, like I said, a system to make the game more shareable. So we actually have all of the resources now in a more convenient kind of location where they could be downloaded. They could be implemented from this as well. And because Offworlders is uh, free to download, I mean, that could be utilized to run the same experience um, as we have done. All right, and now that I've jumped to Lessons 2.0, I will uh, toss it back over to uh, John if there are any things that... Uh, <laughs> uh, John, this for the second round, it was interesting because he was a participant in it the second time round, and so that was a, that was a blast to have as well. Yeah, I purposefully didn't like dive too much into this story because I wanted to be surprised by the story and not sort of leading people in the same way that I had in the first one. Um, so that was a different and fun experience, but I was going to say that like with both of these games, we, even with the original game, we always wanted it to be something that we could hand off to people and just give to others to be able to run as an open source, open access sort of, uh, developmental platform. And so what was nice about switching over to powered by the apocalypse games is one, there's a ton of them and two, there's a lot more support for those games and they're easier to hand off. And so they come with documentation, they come with mechanics all figured out. And if uh, you know a space exploration game is useful for you, that's great. But there are also fantasy games, and there's you know all sorts of different permutations of these games that people could choose from. And so where you know we got initial pushback on the first version of the game that like I don't quite see how I could use this in my class. This one, at least, there are a lot more games. There's a lot more mechanics sort of built out, and so a lot more like variety of things that people could be able to you know might be able to use. And with the the rest of the faculty, where they might not you know want to adopt sort of a full on role playing game like this. We're able to use the games to talk about, okay, again, you know, just at the level of scaffolding, um, how can we better scaffold your course? You know, even if you don't adopt any gameplay aspects, mechanics, just what are your current practices for scaffolding your your learning environment, and how can we maybe improve those a little bit? Um, how are you working on team building in your classroom, and how can we improve that a little bit? And so, whether they were just taking one or two little mechanics, one or two little ideas that are sort of gameful in nature, or they were finding ways to really implement these full-on games. Uh, we were able to, you know, meet people where they were and really help them brainstorm how this stuff could be useful in their own teaching. So that was the the big experience for me. The the fun for me of this second version was just that it was a new space. It's something that I enjoy a little bit more in terms of space exploration and tends to be the type of games that I play a little bit more. And so I really enjoyed that aspect to it. And just the mechanics were so much more robust in the second go around. You could get a lot more gameplay in. And it was a lot more... Um, sort of challenging to me in terms of, of figuring out how I wanted to play the character. And I think a lot of people sort of appreciate that. There's just more variety, more depth to the game. Um, but with that, I think also for Keegan, it, it became a bit of a challenge in that often we were wanting to say like, thank you for running this six week session now. How do we you know, keep playing this uh, for the next several years moving forward? Like we're, in, we're into our game now, like let's keep going. So uh, one of the you know possible drawbacks, I guess, of signing up to lead people on such a, an adventure. 
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, it definitely was uh, a fun experience at the time. And I would say for me, it was fun uh, improvisationally as well um, to like, uh, you know, recognizing what is important to folks, but then bringing that to to the forefront of what it is that we're talking about, how that affects and impacts them and their workplace. Um, all of those things were were phenomenal. We also opened it up, uh, I forgot to mention this, to, this was opened up to uh, anyone. We did it online during like, uh, during lockdown and such for many folks. And so uh, this was not just at our institution, but this was for um, anyone that was, connected with us. Uh, we broadcasted it to a few channels and they kind of joined us. So that was also exciting and fun to kind of expand the the demographics as well. Um, thinking about the lessons learned as well, um, we were excited to move to the Powered by the Apocalypse and the Offworlders for sure. Like without a doubt, it was a positive move. The one thing that was hard during that time is um, because a lot of folks were doing this at their at this time is offworlders went from free to paid momentarily because it started raising money for many of the kind of charities that were big at the time, which was awesome. You know that was great, but it meant that you know for some of our players that were uh, that did not get one of the free uh, copies at the start of the game, that later that that became um, uh, a, a problem for them if they wanted to share it more more widely and such. Um, with that said, you know, we, in thinking about, you know, next time, the next instance of this, because Powered by the Apocalypse is so universal and so easy to build in and craft in, um, looking at our own kind of custom in-house again, but that uses an established system, but then we could openly share as much as we wanted um, in addition to that, though, uh, we still see opportunities for facilitator support. Um, and so that is like from the lessons learned, right? Like folks that are improvisational may be more uh, attuned or comfortable for that facilitator role of the story each week and kind of that uh, that experience as well. So if if you want to practice for it, I mean, leading games like Dungeons and Dragons or things like that would be perfect practice for leading this kind of experience as well. And before we kind of shift back into our like open discussion and questions and all of that, I just want to recognize some of the other work that has happened in the, the Goblin space. We've done some escape rooms and various kinds of permutations in that space. We've also done a round robin narrative lead, which was a wild experience because the facilitation of the topics kind of changed um, from week to week as well. So that was kind of an interesting thing that I think that requires a different kind of um, uh, group to kind of lead and pull off. Um, but that has been kind of experimented with as well. But as we're kind of thinking about what Goblin looks like beyond this time, um, you know, 2023 and beyond, uh, some of the things, like I mentioned, the in-house powered by the apocalypse kind of game that we would craft for it to be universally applicable and freely available for folks. Uh, but additionally, the uh, we've had ideas of like, federated networks of games running simultaneously where one story impacts another and like so many, so many ideas and things that we want to still do in this space and such. Um, so uh, we're, we're always looking to the future. It has definitely been a, a memorable and fun kind of project over the years. And it's really, it's kind of led to some lasting friendships in terms of the scholarship space. So um, that is that is Goblin itself, and I am going to end my screen share uh, because I cannot see the discussion to answer questions so much and engage with you that way um, while I have it enabled. And then uh, we'll kind of transition into questions and to discussion and all of that. Um, I guess I will start with the QA because I see that has some unanswered questions. Uh, it looks like, so the first question is, did you find faculty uh, embraced gamification for the most part? If you had any resistance, how did you overcome it? Ooh, 
Um, I would say, so we had some folks that were more excited about it than others, but I think the thing that we kind of made clear to people is that they could participate at whatever level they wanted to. So we had some folks that participated at, uh, like posted tons of blog posts and tons of reflection and did tons of scholarship. We also had some people that just showed up week to week. They just wanted to come for the discussion and have that percolate percolate from week to week. And that was totally fine. Like they could do that. And it was kind of flexible enough that, you know, depending on how much time folks had or how much they wanted to engage with the ideas and concepts, they could, they could do so. So it was kind of, I guess we kind of bypass the struggle by making it okay to participate at different kind of percentages, I guess, would be a way that I would respond to that as well. Um, there is a question, is this the best place to find out more? Ooh, uh, so the Apocalypse World website that you have linked there, Wendy, is a, um, that is, I believe, the original uh, website for it. There is also a document. Uh, there's a Wikipedia page on Powered by the Apocalypse that is also very handy um, that I would recommend. Let me... Um, I'll post in the chat. I have a document that I will have to pull up again because I had to restart Chrome to get screen share enabled, so I don't have it pulled up yet. Uh, I have a Google Doc that kind of has a lot of the links related to our session and stuff that I will openly share. And that way you all will have the materials, links to our Goblin projects and all of that as well. So I will share that in the chat now. Jessica just asked, were there any metrics after the implementation of Goblin that uh, showcased how successful it was? And that, you know, all administrations, whether you're in higher ed or wherever else, uh, want metrics. So part of the build on the first time around, and also most of the times, most of these other versions that we've run, it, uh, we use blog posts or some other form of sort of week to week um, reflection on both the gameplay and the discussion that we were having that week and thinking about how you could integrate what we were discussing that week into your teaching. And so we were able to use those blog posts as sort of in the moment artifacts of uh, how faculty, how, how our participants were thinking about the gameplay and how they were wanting to integrate it into their classes. So that was useful in terms of feedback to the colleges and to our department. But then we also did a um, end of game uh, survey, just sort of asking what they get out of it. We had a standard survey that we were using with all of our professional development at the time. And so we used that in terms of being able to compare to our other sort of normal professional development uh, sessions. But we also added on a few questions about sort of what were the most useful bits? How do you think you'll uh, use these things uh, down the road. And several of the participants in our early sessions ended up going on to gamify their classes. And so we were able to point to that later on down the road and sort of say, here are the um, the ways that this has been useful uh, to faculty, both at OU. And then one of the uh, graduate students who was in our first sessions uh, went on to become a faculty member elsewhere. And so we were able to point to some of the sessions he was doing at his sort of new jobs. And then also um, Goblin's been adopted by uh, Goblin and another one of our programs called Experience Play have been adopted by a couple of other colleges. And so we're able to sort of point to those as sort of community service. Um, it seems like this type of training is well suited for leadership. Uh, yeah, and Luis was saying, I think as we came in, I, I can't remember if it was prior to the session start or, um, or when this started. But anyway, he was saying that in the gameplay, you can see leadership skills sort of emerge. You can see um, people, you know, sort of moving into different roles uh, within the gameplay. And some of those roles are sort of uh, indicative of, of how they work within a team naturally. And then sometimes it's people trying out different elements of a persona that they might not naturally feel comfortable uh, with. And so we had one of our participants in the first session who is a, is a pacifist um, and believes strongly in pacifism. And he played as a barbarian and was just running around hitting stuff with an ax. And it was just, it was fun to watch and fun for him to get to do, but also to sort of just play with um, sort of the, the the different types of of gameplay and of, of interactions between people. And so, yeah, I think especially for leadership topics, this can be useful. Uh, you say maybe not so much for training like building machinery or fast food cooking. Introducing any kind of tools, and, and again, teamwork is the key piece there. 
And so ways in which you can practice the teamwork, and especially, you know, if you're doing things like fast food cooking, just how are we working as a team? How do we communicate? And so building the communication skills behind the scenes. I agree, it might not be um, as good for sort of hands-on things in teaching those hands-on skills, the, the real, you know, technical piece of the skill. Uh, but in terms of the communication, in terms of the, the team building aspect of it, uh, that's where I would see the utility. Although I imagine people could get creative and, and given enough time, you know, find ways to integrate in the, the technologies themselves. Um, there are a few um, video games. There's some applications. We've been playing with VR a little bit. Um, there's some applications for uh, learning uh, how to operate various machinery in VR and sort of gamified um, machinery introductions. And so I, I'm thinking of there's one for uh, crane operation. There's another one for uh, oil drilling. Um, there's another one for firefighters and just sort of putting people in what would normally be fairly dangerous um, spaces uh, where you really need to understand your craft. Uh, but, you know, obviously not dangerous when you're in the VR or at least much less so. Um, so that, that would be sort of an, an early idea. They, they're we're doing similar things in medical schools and nursing schools in terms of um, scalpel manipulation and even the, the really detailed hand-eye coordination needed to handle scalpels, lasers, other things like that. They're able to practice in VR. And so um, I'd be interested in yeah, imagining sort of tabletop role-playing those experiences. Uh, and maybe that would be not quite the right implementation, but the gamification of those, of those skills is happening and just a matter of um, sort of thinking through what gameplay looks like there. Yeah, I think one of the things that is kind of most exciting about presenting in like this space with this particular audience, right, is like I it's it's so fun to kind of bring the tabletop role playing experience into kind of the community building and such like we've done it in our office several times related to like we've done it. We did it during the uh, during the lockdown of the pandemic. Uh, we replaced like our our uh, end of the week like get togethers and um, happy hours and things with a few of those kind of experiences uh, during the time. And it was kind of phenomenal for that because I still like I still remember when like one of our teammates like sacrificed themselves to save John and John escaped and the other did not. And it's like one of one of the kind of like big, moments that I always attribute. It's it's now become um, like one of my key memories with that coworker and such. And so it's, yeah, it's phenomenal to kind of share in this space because this space, I anticipate there are, uh, whether you are DMs out there or just folks that are uh, interested in leading such experiences uh, you would be more than more than capable more than welcome uh, all of all of those things as well um, and i think you know to sum up like all of kind of like goblin itself like it is a framework but it's flexible and you can use it for um uh, more settings more uh, topics whatever you kind of want in the space um as well so I think I think that open-ended structure, that kind of malleability, is also kind of a valuable uh, aspect of of this conversation too. Keegan, do you remember the CDC game uh, that one of the people ended up building out of our original Goblin group? Um, I would have to go back and look <laughs> at the, some links. The basics that I remember on that one was it was someone from um, uh, she teaches anatomy classes and biology, you know, in general. And um, a lot of her students end up becoming doctors or at least working in public health, you know, some aspect around that. And what she did was a fairly easy, or not easy, but a, a sort of streamlined simulation. And so she had students, she sort of uh, pointed out the various career steps that you might work through as you're becoming a doctor, or as you're becoming someone who works for the CDC and sort of working your way up through um, sort of governmental public health uh, route. And then she had her students sort of play through the various steps of that with the different uh, types of tasks that would be assigned to them in each of those roles. And then they would have to complete various levels moving up. And so it was a it was a gamified experience in that field that didn't rely so much on the mechanics of our games, but it was still the idea of just introducing these uh, students to professionalization within their field through this game mechanic. And I thought that was a really interesting application that could be used across just any number of disciplines 
where you don't have to worry so much about the mechanics, but just thinking about what is it in your discipline that you're trying to teach folks and having, you know, sort of a simulation that they can work through in order to prepare them for the field. Another one was just uh, a faculty member having his students do a simulation of sort of a, a conference that they might go to. And so he ended up having sort of a mini conference and sort of gamifying, you know, people coming in and giving them critiques, some of those pieces. And so simulate the difference between simulation and game is, is a pretty thin uh, barrier and, um, and sort of breaking out from, you know, I really need a fantasy environment and rolling dice and all of those kinds of things. And just thinking about, you know, what is it that you're trying to help your, your students, your, your participants do, and, uh, and how might games offer insights along the way. Also, I'm pretty sidetracked by this whole cybersecurity game idea, really thinking through all sorts of cyberpunk ideas. Um, so I've been playing a lot of cyberpunk 2077 also, so. All right. Any other questions or things? Keegan, I was going to ask you sort of, now that you're DMing <laughs> way too many games at any given point, and, uh, and also, you know, DMing repeatedly for sort of university based audiences, what is it that you get out of all of this as DM? Like what, what keeps you doing this? Um, I, so it may seem strange because of the amount of work that it takes, but it's actually something that rejuvenates me. Um, it, it rejuvenates me to the point that I, I don't want to stop like playing and like that's what keeps keeps me coming back to it. Like there'll be times where we'll have to take breaks because you know we're doing like family things are coming up or the holidays are, are in session. But it's just, I don't know, telling stories together has been, become such an important part of my life. It's led to me doing more kind of like writing. It's led to me doing more kind of world building. It's led to, I mean, uh, there. this is a, a different kind of can of worms and story, but it, it helped me recover from a, a, a brain surgery that I had many, many years ago at this point. Like it's been something that just helps me uh, heal and recharge is what it is. So I think that is kind of like where it fits into my life uh, at, at the moment. Yeah, for me on the game playing side of things, I mean, it, it, as you said earlier on, it is one of those things that I can look forward to on any given week when we're having one of these sessions with our office. Um, I also, I was, I was, this is a slight sidetrack, but I was remembering the uh, the person who sacrificed their their life uh, to save me. Um, I'm the assistant director for our office, and so there's a weird sort of um, slight like boss employees relationship thing that's weird when I'm game playing. And so I try not to bring that into the game. Like I try to have my character have no influence on other people. Um, but I did think that there was a weird dynamic there when he sacrificed his life uh, to save mine. Um, also, like I've often been like uh, a betrayer in our games, and like purposefully like sought the downfall of our entire group. Um, and so I enjoy those elements of uh, of turning the leadership model on its head. Um, but I think it's an interesting thing as someone in a leadership position to uh, to get to play with. Well, awesome. I think we are about at time if there's any or uh, I see Lisa's coming back on board here. Yeah, this has been so fascinating, you guys. I I'm, I think I'm kind of like Julia where um, I wish I could form like <laughs> some like um, an, a cogent thought because I have like so many questions, but then you move on to something else and I'm like, oh, man, now listen to this. It's so great. Um, especially the overlap with community that's really like making my my head spin because i think that that is something that i've noticed but but just didn't quite put together and and like when i saw the group on friday playing together how satisfying that was for me and i didn't realize like specifically why but that was it was because it was 
there was this group that had been formed. There were these relationships being formed. And as somebody who has tried to you know, construct TLDC as a place that was really inclusive and for a lot of people to just come together that might not have any anywhere else to go, seeing that manifestation actually happen was really, really incredible. So, and you're, you're sort of articulating that in a way for me that, you know, my, you know, in my sick sort of, you know, cold, like brain sort of half delusional, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I love this. And I do think that um, Julia, who has the next session, um, and she is a cybersecurity professional, um, the concept of her session, the game itself that she was building is pretty incredible. So tune into that because um, the backstory that she had kind of like, it really blew my mind when she first told it to me. I don't think I expressed how <laughs> how amazing that was. I'm like, you came up with that whole storyline? And she's like, yeah. So um, that's that should be really, really fun um, for this next session. And um, let's see, with that, I don't know, you're getting lots of kudos in chat the both of you. So I really appreciate your time and for participating in this event. And, um, you know, yeah, let's do more of this stuff. This is great. This is so fun. Like it hasn't felt like work at all to me. Just going through it has been, um, has been like, actually I feel guilty how, about how much fun it was to build out this event. So I appreciate the both of you participating in it. Of course, always happy to. Um, talk about games and tabletop role playing and how they fit into life. So, yeah, yeah. And the whole lineup, all the speakers have just been absolutely, I mean, just hilarious and fun. And um, it's not going to stop. We still have some 10 sessions to go for this event. So, um, <laughs> we've got a ways to go. So, um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and just close out the session. Keegan, John, thank you. Thanks so much again for, um, for, for participating. And if people want to get a hold of you, like LinkedIn, they could reach out, reach out there. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I um, put our, in that Google doc, I put our LinkedIn links. So if you click on our names, um, happy to connect with you there. Excellent. I'll put the doc in chat one more time. Excellent. I'm still on Great. Twitter for the moment. Um, until it collapses. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter, what Twitter? What Twitter? <laughs> Whatever that thing is. Now. Yeah, that thing. That thing we all used to use so much. All right, everybody. Thanks again. And we'll see you. Let's see. Um, Julia's up in just another 12 minutes or so. And hopefully my voice will hold up for a little while. And um, we'll see everybody then. Thanks again. Thanks all. <laughs>